Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Thursday night Bible study right here at New Psalmist. Glad to have you joining us as we continue week after week coming together, growing in the Word. I do hope that you have had a blessed day and a blessed week as we get ready to share the Word of God together from the cutting room floor, sharing that which has flown over, filled over even, spilled over from our Sunday morning worship experience. So before we even dive in, I want you to help me spread the word. So tag somebody, text somebody, hit the share button, invite them to come on and join you on the New Psalmist YouTube platform, our YouTube channel, that we might grow in the word of God together. And I'm just so glad that you're here with us tonight. There's so much going on that I wanna share about and I'm excited about getting into this message because Sunday morning, didn't get to share all of it, so there's a whole lot that I want to get into tonight. Um, but first, hit that button. Invite somebody to come in. And even as you're already in, I know we normally do this on our own, but come on and greet somebody right there on the virtual sanctuary in our YouTube channel. Tag their name. Tell them good evening. Matter of fact, let us know where you're joining us from. If you're in Baltimore, another part of Maryland, DMV, maybe you're in a whole other state altogether, go ahead and drop it right there so we can know where we're sharing with each other from. The blessing of virtual ministry is we have a chance to reach far beyond the walls and we're able to share and worship and fellowship with brothers and sisters both far and near. So make sure you let us know where you're joining us from. And we invite you to not only follow us here on YouTube, but also Facebook and Instagram at New Psalmist. You can find us right there. Hit those follow buttons to know what's going on at the church. There's a lot going on right now. I'm going to get to it in just a moment. But first, we're going to go to God in prayer. So let's pray together. Father and our God, first and foremost tonight, we thank you. Thanksgiving is always the first thing that comes forth from our hearts and our lips. God, we thank you tonight that you are God. We thank you for your presence and power, your grace, your mercy, your joy, your love, your favor, all that you are. We thank you for you. And tonight, God, we come asking that you might speak to us in a special way. Make your presence known as we share in this time, as the word goes forth in this space. Help us to grow. Help us to become. Help us to leave from this place and log off from this place better than when we logged on. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Again, invite somebody to join you. Come on in because I want to know, let you know what's going on here at New Psalms before we dive into tonight's uh, Bible study, if you will. This continuation really from Sunday morning tonight. But first, I want to let you know this and I want to thank you. Uh, this past Sunday, we kicked off our installation season. We had our pre-installation worship service. Pastor John Jenkins and First Baptist Church of Glen Arden came down the road, joined us for worship, had a great time in the house of the Lord, sharing in communion as well. I want to thank every member and friend who joined us, and I want to let you know this is just the beginning. We are now in the season of installation. We are now in the season where we're getting closer and closer to the day that God brings together pastor and people. I'm excited about this season God has us in. We've been seeing the hand of God moving and working already in our worship services and in weekday experiences. And we just know that God has great things in store for the future of the New Psalmist Baptist Church. And so Sunday kicked off our installation season where we're continuing things next Thursday night. I want you to mark the date, this time, this station, next Thursday night on our YouTube platform at our normal Bible study time, we're going to be sharing in what we're calling the conversation station, where First Lady Jarette and myself get an opportunity to share with our congregation in this virtual space. We get to share a little bit of who we are and, and get, let you get to know who Walter is and who Jarette is. There'll be other times for you to get to know, you know, church form and function and all that good stuff to get to know Reverend, Doctor and First Lady. But we want you to get a chance to see us for who we are and get to know what we're about. And so next Thursday night, seven o'clock right here, the conversation station. You don't want to miss it. I would encourage you even to get some of your church family and friends gather together, get some of your family members gather together and join, have a watch party or viewing party for the conversation station. We're going to be answering questions that have been sent in by our membership. And there were a lot of questions sent in, so we couldn't answer all of them. 
But we were able to sort through our team, our committee was able to sort through and get some questions to help you get a chance to see who we are, get to know who we are. And so we're excited about doing this. We're excited about sharing this with you. I'm excited about the questions that are going to be shared and asked. So make sure you're tuned in next Thursday night. And then on May the 4th at 10 a.m., we have installation service. That that is the service where the formal act of installation will take place. That is the service where I will be installed as the new pastor of New Psalmist Baptist Church, the next pastor, the fourth pastor in 125 years. Wow. That is just a testament to the greatness and the goodness of our God and his faithfulness of his church and his people. And so May the 4th, we want to make sure that you are here to be a part of that. And we want you to get here early. Of course, get here early. We'll be sharing more about the times and what have you. Asking on that day that you bring your patience with you a little bit of extra because there are going to be visitors here both far and near, members both far and near, persons returning home on that day. And we want to make sure that we do everything in a most excellent way. And so some things will be a little different than a normal worship service. But we want you to come out for this once in a lifetime moment, something many of us have never seen at New Psalmist. And some of us, again, this will be a once in a lifetime experience. We want you to be here Saturday, May the 4th at 10 a.m. right here, 6020 Marion Drive, as we celebrate the service of installation. And that Sunday, we'll be right in worship. So God has us in the midst of a major season in the life and the history of the New Psalmist Baptist Church. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'm just glad to be alive and to be a part of it. There's always other stuff going on here. Next Saturday is our men's class with Bishop, 9 a.m., right at the church. Uh, we also have coming up, we have um, a one-year anniversary of Chosen in a couple of weeks. And if you're one of the ones who adopted a child for Chosen, uh, don't forget that those automatic payments continue. And so with this being the one-year mark of you fulfilling your pledge, make sure if you're, if you're cutting that off, you have to go in manually into the Chosen system to make sure you stop that payment. But we're going to be doing even more uh, with Chosen and World Vision, rather. So make sure you keep your ears attuned. But want to make sure you let you know that if it's on automatic, you have to automatic, you have to go in and manually turn that option off so it does not continue to be withdrawn uh, from your account in the Chosen system. So, oh, last thing, and then we're going to get into this word. Sunday after service, new members. Don't forget, we have our fellowship with you right after service on Sunday. All right. Sunday, I continued in the series, and I'm excited about the series, y'all, Standing on Business. Standing on Business. The contemporary way of really saying I'm taking care of business. I'm, I'm, I'm ten toes down. You know, what, what's mine, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm coming correct. I'm standing on business. I'm standing firm. I'm not backing down. That, that's what that terminology means, and it's become... The, the series theme that Bishop and I are preaching on, Bishop will continue it this Sunday. But I've started the message last week from standing on business with the theme, when the going gets tough, coming from the scripture, Matthew chapter 28. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew 28. You got your Bible or, or you have your app. Matthew chapter 28 is where I want to draw your attention on today um, and, and kind of share what I wasn't able to share on Sunday, uh, because it is so much in these few verses, 16 through 20, where this is Jesus speaking to the followers after he's resurrected, after he's gotten out of the grave. He's giving them this command, this commission that we call it, the Great Commission, which means so much to who we are today. I'm going to read the verses in just a moment. Verses 16 through 20 is what I'm going to read. Matter of fact, let me just read, uh, I'm going to read verse 19, verse 18 and 19. Verse 18, NIV says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 says, And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. 
from this scripture. The title was when the going gets tough. That whole idea of going when Jesus says to go, that the call for us is that we might go, that we not stay put, that we not stand still, that we not become comfortable, that that we be on the move. This Christian journey is about being on the move. Discipleship is about being on the move. This walk with God, it is not a, a ride where he carries us, but we are walking, we're on the move, constantly in motion with this call that we have been given. And so when the going gets tough, that going, that moving, when it gets tough, I shared Sunday that we have to confront it. One of the things I learned years ago in leadership and ministry, more so in pastoral leadership, I learned this, and this is one of my core values as a leader. Nothing will change if you do not confront it. If you're looking for change, if you're looking for something to shift, something to get better, for something to work, you must confront it. You must deal with it. You must point it out. You must stand up before it. You must confront it. So when the going gets tough, when the moments come up in this walk with God and our call and our responsibility, whatever it is that we have been assigned, called to do, created to be, there'll be times and seasons when it gets tough. But the only way that the tough changes or the tough becomes something that is uh, more palatable is that you confront it. If we do not confront it, nothing will change. Nothing will happen. We must confront it. But confronting it with this, like I like to call this holy conf confidence, not just being confident where it seems to be arrogant and prideful, but a holy confidence. Because Jesus is laying out for us what our business really is what our work is, what our assignment is. In Matthew 28, in these latter verses, he's laying out for us our curriculum, if you will. If we were in school, this is our syllabus. This is our curriculum. This is what the objective is of the course. It's found here in the Great Commission to go make disciples, baptizing, teaching. It, it is the core mission of the church. And right here, our mission should always be clear. No matter what, it starts and ends with the Great Commission. The Great Commission tells us, real simple, make disciples. If anybody asks you, what is the call of your church? It ought to be to make disciples. Well, what, what is your ministry about? Making disciples. What is your fellowship about? Making disciples as one who is called, as one who, who walks with God, as one who claims to be a Christian, what are you about? Making disciples. That, that is what we are about at our core. Everything that we do points back to that, making disciples. But how, how do you make disciples? Does it have to be a three-year program? How do you make disciples? Is there a curriculum that we must follow? Yeah, go, baptize, teach. Go, getting out of the confines of what you know, whether it is a physical location or a, or a environment where you're comfortable, getting out of that. Go, as a matter of fact, it says to go make disciples of all nations, which implies nations different than your own. So getting out of that which is familiar to you, your own safe space, and going out into areas where you are the foreigner, into cultures where you are the foreigner, into environments where you are the foreigner, into social circles where you are the foreigner, where you're the new kid on the block, going out and making disciples. So you're going out. You're not staying in. You're going out. It's not just where you gather. It is going out. There, how do you make disciples? You go you baptize, and while baptism, yes, there is the actual act, the ordinance that we do in the Baptist church, baptism by immersion. We have the pools out front now, and we dunk people in the pool. That is the act of baptism. But baptism happens before you're baptized. I, I want to say it again for somebody whose internet may be buffering. Baptism happens before you're baptized. Baptism is the outward sign of an inward change. 
the inward change is the key. The transformation happening inside is the key. The work that God has done inside of you is the key. If there is an outward sign with no inward change, there is no baptism. But get this, if there is an inward change without an outward sign, you have been baptized. I, I know I, I never went to the water. Nobody ever dunked me. But God, God put to rest the old you and brought forth a new you within. See, when we baptize in church and in the Baptist church, you see it with the immersion. It is the going down of the old and the rising, raising up of the new. It is that old me going down and being washed away and a new me coming forth. But it's not happening because I've been dunked in water. That, that water has no special power. It is water that comes from a faucet, a hose here at New Psalmist Baptist Church. And because we're kind, we make sure it's warm. So you're not getting into a freezing pool. Our team works to get them heaters and everything to make sure when we can, the water is at a good temperature. So you're not freezing when you're baptized. But that moment is the outward sign. A sign points to something else. That sign points that a change has happened within. And so our work, our business, is not just going, baptizing, bringing forth transformation in the lives of people. Our work is about helping people see who God's called them to be. Our work is about helping people come alive in Christ, that the old them might be cast away, the old them might die, and a new them might emerge. And while there is the outward expression done through the act of baptism, it must first be preceded by that internal change. It is an outward sign of an inward change. And I would submit to you that the inward change is more critical to the Christian journey and the Christian walk and the call of God than the outward sign. I, I just want to lift that to you tonight. So I'll work. Even if you say, well, I can't get to any water. I can't pour it on somebody. I can't dunk them. I can't get them to a bathtub. But God, I've, I've worked with them in such a way and preached and testified and shown the love of God in such a way that an inward change has taken place. Then you are about the business of the church. Going, making disciples is about going, baptizing, teaching. He says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, while there is not a order in which he lists these things, I want to look at, have you look at the order they're in. Go, baptize, teach which means that there's always something to learn. If this is a chronological sequence, that first I must go in all the nations. Baptize. So I am working, I am going about the business of seeing lives changed, seeing people transformed. But even after that, there's still teaching that has to take place. Even after there has been an inward change, there's continued development and growth as we teach and disciple disciples. We continue to make disciples. Making disciples or discipleship rather is a continuous journey. I would say it's one that we are on until we are no more. I shared this recently with our leaders. When we look at the Bible and see those first 12, 11, if you do not include Judas, but even then he's replaced by Matthias and then Paul also becomes an apostle. But with those first called group, Jesus disciples them for three years. I shared with our leaders, the reason why it was three years, it's not that deep. The reason why it was three years is because after year three, he died. They crucified him. Year three. Otherwise, discipleship continues. 
Discipleship is not something that ends when we complete a program, walk across the stage, shake the pastor's hand. It's not something that concludes when we finish a workbook or a textbook. Discipleship is continual. We are always growing and becoming and learning more about who God is, who God has called us to be, what God has placed in us, who we've been created to be. There's always a new revelation. We continue to be discipled. Even when we are making disciples, we are to still be being disciples. I hope that was good English. If not, I'm sorry. But even as we're making disciples, we should still be about the work of becoming disciples. So I'm still being made as a disciple. Even as a pastor, I'm being discipled by my pastor. As a, as a senior pastor of the New Psalms Baptist Church, in a couple of, it'll be official May the 4th, you know, fully installed as a, a pastor, not a pastor elect, but pastor of New Psalms, I will still be a disciple of Bishop Walter Scott Thomas Sr. Because I am still growing and developing. I am still walking with Jesus Christ, still walking with God. I'm still on this Christian journey, and this journey is one of continual discipleship. Go, baptize, teach. So we teach those whom we are making disciples, because disciples ought to make disciples. Even as I'm being discipled, I'm about the work of making disciples. And all of us are somewhere on this spectrum of being taught how to be a better and a more, here it is, empowered disciple. Right? So go, baptize, teach. But there's one more thing in this curriculum. We go, we baptize, we teach. Get this. Those are the things we're doing to make disciples but then there's one more piece that we should be doing as well as disciples. We have to make sure that we remember. We have to make sure that we remember. While as we're making disciples, we're going, we're baptizing, we're teaching. But as the disciple maker, we have to remember. When Jesus says that last line, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, that for you and I is the call to remember He's with us. Remember his presence. Remember he is always with us to the very end of the age, which for us means when we come to the end of our journey, he's with us. All throughout the journey, he's with us. During this work, he is with us. So, so we do this work knowing he's with us, but we do this work also rooted Remember, as I said Sunday, and what came before. He's not just with us, but he is with us having all authority. I remember I highlighted that word, therefore, which is found um, in verse number 19, therefore, go, meaning you got to look at what came before. And so if I'm telling you to go, make disciples, baptize, teach, I'm saying this because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is what you can stand upon. And that is why when the going gets tough, we have this holy confidence. That confidence is rooted and grounded in the power of God. That confidence is rooted and grounded in knowing that he has all authority. Because provision always precedes problems. I want to say it again, and somebody help me, just type it in the virtual sanctuary. Provision precedes problems. When I talk about the going getting tough, when this walk with God, this call to disciple, this commission we've been given, when it gets tough, we can be confident with a holy confidence because we know provision will precede the problem. It comes before the obstacle. Think of the words of the hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. The, the, the line that says, All I have needed, your hand has provided. Past tense. It's already provided. Because God is eternal, everything that he's done has already been done. And so that which is needed, God not only will provide, he has provided. It is already done. And so I can have this confidence because I know he's already provided. 
that he's given provision for whatever the problem or the tough time or tough season is, God has already given provision for it. And so I want to move on because our time is moving. And I want to get to the things I could not share on Sunday, that which ended up on the cutting room floor. When I talk about these tough times, that that happened when, when, when the going gets tough. And, and, and let's, let's be honest, doing the work of the kingdom is not always easy. It's not always easy because we do the work of the kingdom with people in the world. We do the work of God with people who are living day by day life, with folk who are more controlled by their human nature than by the God that dwells in them. And we're called to go and help them see God, not just in the earth, but in themselves. It can be tough because life is tough. And folk who have been through a tough life will respond with a tough response. So sometimes the going gets tough. The Christian journey gets tough. The call of God gets tough. The work of the kingdom gets tough. When it gets tough, we must confront it. Not run, not hide, not shirk, not wait. We must confront it with a holy confidence. But also, this is why I couldn't get Sunday, with an awareness of your covering. With an awareness of your covering. Verse 18 Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I love how Jesus states it. All authority in heaven and on earth. I, he lets us know I'm covering all ground. I'm covering all the territory you need be concerned about. All authority in heaven and on earth, all that dwells therein has been given to me. So everything in heaven and on earth is under his control. That I don't know about anybody else, but that makes me shout because it means I'm covered everywhere. On, in earth, on, in earth, in heaven rather, and on earth, all authority has been given. Jesus says it's been given to me. Now that does not just mean that he has authority over the trees and the birds and the wind and the skies and the sea, which he does, but it also means he has control, authority, and a covering over us. He's responsible for you and me. He has covered you and me. And covering, we think about how we're covered. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're covered by the Spirit of God. We are covered by the power of God. We, we are covered. The old song says, oh, to be kept. We're kept and we're covered by God. Here, here's an interesting fact I want to share with you. And right now, at this very moment, there are angels fighting on your behalf. When we read the book of Daniel and the angel comes down and has conversation. He says that I would have been here, but I've been caught up fighting in the third heaven. I believe it was the third heaven. There, there is a angelic war going on where the forces of God are working for our good. Somebody may say that sounds like a whole lot of stuff that I don't really know all about. That's fine. It's not some stuff is not for us to fully understand until we meet him in the end. But just know that God is fighting for you, sending forces, fighting on your behalf, even right now. It goes back to the old words of the prayer that our grandmothers and grandfathers would pray. And even now, some of us as parents pray over our children. Lord, keep them from dangers seen and unseen. You got to be aware of the covering and know and trust and believe that you are covered. When Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It means that we have a covering over us, that we have been covered and kept, that we've been kept from situations that sought to overcome us. And so we must know 
who our covering is, and get this, and who it's always been. When Jesus comes to them on that Resurrection Sunday, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who gave it to him? Who gave Jesus this authority? Who was able to give him the authority in heaven and on earth? It would have been the one who possessed it before. If Jesus, God the Son, now has it, he receives it from God the Father. Now, I know there's a whole lot of theological stuff in there I could get into with God the Father, God the Son being one God, three persons. That Jesus is God. He is the Word made flesh. But the way in which he's speaking is helping us to understand that the authority now rests in the Redeemer, rests in the Savior, rests in the one, get this, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. He has all authority. That person of the Trinity, that person of the Godhead, that, that function, if you will, has all authority on heaven and earth. It is the covering now under God, the Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus the Christ. But it's given from God the Father, which means he has authority first. Let me tell you who never had authority, the adversary, your enemies, the forces that seek to steal, kill, and destroy. They never have and never will have authority over you. I want to say it again because I want it to sink in. The forces that seek to kill and destroy, they never have and they never will have authority over you. Our God has all power and all authority. That, my brothers and sisters, ought to not just build up this holy confidence even all the more, but it is the assurance and what we can never forget, the awareness we must have of what our covering is, who our covering is. It is God and God alone and it's always been God. God's always been covering you. There's no other power or source, even though it may have claimed to have authority and may have tried to act like it has authority. Our God always has the final say. And so we must have an awareness. We must have an awareness. We must have an awareness of our covering. Anything or anyone else that has ever tried to act as if it has authority over you, meaning that it has tried to either redirect or deny you from what God has spoken and promised, it was a lie. Anything that has tried to do that, claim to have some sense of authority, it's a lie. Now, I'm not saying that when it comes to the familiar relationship that parents do not have authority over their children. If any children listen, you better listen to your parents. Now, just go ahead and listen to that. But I'm saying when it comes down to those forces, sources, and powers that try to deter, deny, redirect, make you feel as though you are not worthy, make you feel as though you do not have permission or a right to seek the things of God, to go forward with the plan of God for your life and the call of God for your life, they have no authority. And I need you to go ahead and help me type that in the virtual sanctuary, all caps, exclamation points. They have no authority. Matter of fact, you can just put those two words as a hashtag. No authority. Our God has all authority. Stop believing what everybody else tells you about yourself and believe who God has said you are. Believe that you are who God created and called you to be. Well, one of the things that breaks my heart is to see people who shut doors on themselves because of what people have told them, because of what their life situation has told them about themselves, because of the stereotype they have about where they come from and what their upbringing has been. It, it breaks my heart to see someone not see themselves the way God sees them, to not see themselves the way God created them. 
One of the things I have learned, and I hope I can share this with you tonight in such a way that it might take root and take hold in your secret, in your spirit rather, is that the scripture is true. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is how I've learned, like Paul, to be content in any situation, knowing I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That if God spoke it, if God has brought it in my path, I can do it because he gives me strength. I can do it because he laid it before me. I can do it because if God thought enough of me to bring it to me, I need you to hear this about you. If God thought enough about you to bring it before you, it's because he knows you can do it. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Maybe you're King James Saints through Christ who strengthens me. Either way. He gives us the strength because he has all authority. So going gets tough. You have that confronted with a holy confidence and an awareness of your covering. But you're also confronted with an assurance of everlasting company. The assurance, an assurance rather, of everlasting company. That last verse that I read to you about the part that we do, we remember, is verse 20. Remember, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I'll read it to you from the message translation, which is Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible, more contemporary language. He says he says it this way, takes the words of Jesus in verse 20 and puts it like this. I'll be with you. As you do this day after day, right up to the very end of the age. Let me read it again. I'll be with you as you do this day after day, right up to the end of the age. So let's let's use that language. I'll be with you. Jesus saying, I will be with you. I'll be present. I'll be there with you. You're not alone. I'm with you. I'll be with you. Get this. As you do this, so as you fulfill this commission, as you do this work, as you make disciples, as you go, as you baptize, as you teach, I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day. It's not a one time thing. It's not I got one. I'm good. I remember years ago we had a button that said my goal, one soul. And that was a great slogan. It was wonderful. But some folk thought after one soul, I would met my goal and I was done. No, my goal, one soul. And then again, my goal, another one, my goal, another one. Like like DJ Khaled says, another one. We are to continually make disciples. So I'll be with you as you're making disciples day after day after day as we're continuing to not be selfish with our salvation, but to spread the love of God to as many as we can. Because we want this family of faith to grow to be large. So as we do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age, when I'm done with this life's journey all the way up to the end, Jesus, I'll be with you. There's an everlasting company. We are never alone. He's always with us. Every tough day, he's there. Every tough moment, he's there. Every tough season, he is there. There's no doubt and we ought not have any doubt. He is there. We have the assurance of everlasting company. He's there and he's in control. (laughs) On control over all in heaven and on earth. He's with you, over you, with authority over you and all that's around you and his presence, his existence, his company has no end. I'll put it this way. His presence is perpetual. That, that's a good thing to know about our God. It's a good thing to know about the word of God that is shared with us. Because there are some times where you may not hear that voice, but you can read that word. You may not say, well, I don't, I don't hear God speaking right now. Open up the book. I'm a witness. God will speak to you from his word. You say, well, I don't have my Bible on me. Thank God for the smartphone. Go ahead and download version and join the new Psalmist community in there as well. 
I don't have my phone, my smart device, left it at home. Get down on your knees and just start talking to him. Just start talking to God like he's sitting there right beside you. Because he is. Because he is always there. His presence is perpetual. He's always there with us. And so when the going gets tough, y'all know the, the regular slogan, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Can you just say that about yourself real quick? I am a tough cookie. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. But here's the truth about these tough times. The tough times are no match for our God. That they're no match for the one who has all authority. He has authority over the tough times. And when the going gets tough, not only do the tough get going, our God gets going. Our God gets to work. That's why we ought not be ashamed to call on him, to call the name of the Lord, to call out and cry out to him when it gets tough. Because that's when God is at his best. The Bible says that his strength is made perfect in weakness. When we're weak, he is strong. When those tough times come, when we cannot handle it, don't see how we're going to get through it. That's when God steps in and God shows out. When times get tough, our God steps in. So call on him. Because you have this assurance of ever or rather eternal and everlasting company he's always there matter of fact i'll close with this he's not just always there he's already there that which precedes you that which we have not even seen yet that which we will go into which is difficult and hard and rough he's already there and so when I'm talking about standing on business, when times get tough and hard, you can still stand 10 toes down, firm and confident, because you know he's with you and he's already in it. And he's over it. That, that, that's how good and how awesome, how strong our God is. He's prepared you for the situation, and he's prepared the situation for you. Now, I ain't going to lie. This is a Sunday morning. I would have hollered right there and at least did maybe two and three-quarter stomps. He's prepared you for the situation. So God's been working on you, training and developing you, building you up. But he's also prepared the situation for you, that God has been working in the areas we cannot yet see. He's been making ways and opening doors that when we go into the tough times, the tough times will not overtake us. But we shall come forth when the going gets tough. We're going to keep going. Saying the words of the old song, I will trust in the Lord until I die. I want to close with the words of this song. Somebody says, never alone. I don't have to worry because I'm never alone. He walks beside me. Every day, he guides my footsteps all the way. I'm never alone. And church, I'm grateful tonight that in this time of study, as we wrap it up, we can declare we are never alone. When the going gets tough, and when it will, the going does get tough. Be confident. You confront it with the holy confidence, with, with, the, with the, the, the assurance, or the awareness, rather, of your covering, and the assurance of eternal and everlasting company. It's going to get tough, but God is not just with you, working on and in you, but he's been working in and through it because he has all authority. I do pray tonight something was said that blessed you, that helped you, that helped you to grow and develop. We're getting ready to go. We're going to give our, tie, our, our offerings on tonight. Then we're going to leave from this place. But don't forget, next week, the Conversation Station. Make sure you join us right here on our YouTube platform. I want to thank you for those who give tonight and on Sundays and whenever. 
It allows us to offer this type of ministry, to do what we do here at New Psalmist, to do what we do in the walls, outside the walls, and in the virtual space is all made possible because of your generosity and your stewardship. So we're getting ready to give. You can use Givelify, you can use Pushpay, Fellowship One. You can even give it on your envelope on Sunday. Just write in Bible study gift, whatever you're giving, however you're giving. Thank you so much for the seeds you sow into this ministry. Just this week, your giving has allowed us to be a blessing to families through our pantry on the, the Go program, able to give out food to persons through our partnerships as well. God is just using New Psalmist in an awesome way to do the work of the church that we might bless and minister to others, but most importantly, that we stand on business, the business of making disciples. And that is what we do as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close out in prayer. We'll pray over our gifts as well. Father and our God, we thank you tonight. We thank you again for your presence and power. We thank you right now for what you've given us to give. We give it back tonight to be a blessing to the work of your church and to your people. And God, we thank you even the more for giving us the clear direction, the clear call to go into this world and make disciples. God, I pray tonight that we be about your business, your work, that we stand on the business of making disciples. We take care of the business of making disciples. We do the work of making disciples. Again, not just recycling membership from church to church, but going out into all the nations, baptizing and teaching that somebody might come to the awareness of who you are and the love you have for them. Now, God, I pray you continue to keep cover, lead, and guide as we leave and log off from this place tonight until we gather together again. Keep us as only you can. And God, in all things, we'll give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, together we all say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you next week. We'll either see you Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or next Thursday for the Conversation Station right here on our YouTube channel. Be blessed. Have a great evening.